So why don't we begin today by reading our series verse in Romans chapter 8. Would you grab your Bible out real quick while you stay standing? I'm going to let you sit in a minute, but as you stay standing, let's go to Romans chapter 8, our series verse, which is verse 28. It says this, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. For those he, whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. If it's okay with you, I want to read one more passage of Scripture this morning in Luke chapter 4, verse 14. What we're going to find in this Scripture is Jesus has just come out of the wilderness after fasting for 40 days and being tempted by Satan. It says this in Luke 4, 14, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And a report about Him went out through all the surrounding country. And He taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And He came to Nazareth, where He had been brought up. And as was His custom, He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Yeah, I mean, that passage right there just deserves an applause. Today, I want to preach a sermon I'm entitling, Favor Ain't For Everyone. Favor ain't for everyone. Why don't we pray? Lord Jesus, we are ready. We're ready for you to speak. We're ready for you to move. God, we pray that today you would be glorified that we would grow in our understanding of both you and your word and how we can outwork it in our lives. I'm talking about favor, God, we pray for favor for our dear 49ers. God, would you bless them in their endeavors today? And all the saints said, amen, amen, amen. Come on, would you high five five people as you get ready to take your seats? Come on, five people. Thank you, worship team. Outstanding, spectacular. Favor ain't for everyone. You know, I wonder what you think of when you hear the word favor. I wonder what you think of when you hear the word favor. I'm wondering if you think of unexpected blessings. The kind of blessings, you know, like the parking spot in the city, that convenient city parking spot. Anybody from the city, you know what I'm talking about. Not searching for hours like you just pull up and then ride out the front. I love that. Maybe a clear carpool lane. Maybe finding money in your pocket. Favor ain't fair. You know what I'm talking about. I wonder if you know favor like a seed upgrade on a flight. Anybody know that kind of favor? I mean, surely nothing screams favor than a first class upgrade on a flight. And I take it by the three claps that there's only three people in here who have experienced the highly favor of the Lord upon your life where you get bumped up. You didn't pay for it. You were privileged enough to get selected to be elevated in life. And for those who don't know the favor of a first class upgrade, let me tell you, it is different. It's not just the in-flight experience where you get the plush snacks and all those kinds of things, but it's the post-flight experience where you're, you're relaxed. You're not wretched. You haven't been fighting for your piece of luggage and swapping somebody because they've got yours. You literally walk out blissful. Like, let's do that again. (laughs) During COVID, when no one was flying, uh, we were flying and we flew overseas and we got a first class upgrade on an overseas flight. That's different. That's not just a wider seat. That's a flatbed. You know what I'm talking about. That comes with pajamas. It's incredible. I felt like Drake. I'm up there like using absolutely everything. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, man, I wonder how much people pay for this. This is epic. 
And it's so surreal when you're up there because when you're in economy, like you're putting your bag up and you're trying to get sorted and the hostess is saying, uh, uh, sir, can you sit down? We need, to, we need to push off. When you're in first class, they do the plane schedule based on you. When you're ready, sir, you let us know and we'll, we'll push back. It's a different experience. You're a different class citizen. I wonder if you've ever been traveling and you've experienced when there's only one upgrade on offer and you're with your wife. I mean, ladies, that's got to be favor. When, 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 when your husband gets the offer to upgrade and he shows that kind of favor to you and says, honey, would you like to take it? Unfortunately, Kira has never experienced this yet in her life. But how many people know favor ain't fair? That's not favor, okay? That's not favor. Can you loosen up today? I know you're hoping for something deeply spiritual in that moment. I need you to loosen up. I need you to get on my level. We're talking about the favor of God. In fact, maybe we could spend a little bit of time at the beginning of this sermon to unpack exactly what favor is, because I'm sure that even without knowing exactly what it is, or maybe even be able, being able to fully define it, we all still want it in our lives. I don't think if I ask for hands, and I won't because you're still not participatory as much as I'd want you to be just yet, but I'm sure if I did, everybody would want the favor of God. Even if I couldn't put it down in a sentence, even if I couldn't articulate it theologically or doctrinally, I still want it. It sounds nice to have the favor of God on our life. So a good place for us to orient ourselves when it comes to understanding the favor of God would be to consider the way we favor. Or should I say, have favorites. For instance, and this should be no surprise, but your favorite people are the ones you, you most often want to be with those that you delight in, and essentially the people that you have a closer connection with. You know what I'm talking about. Even if you have a lot of friends and you have a lot of connections, you still have your favorites. At least could you nod at me like I'm preaching good stuff, right stuff today. A little head nod, it's not too hard. You'll be jumping on your couch or the football later. In church, we can at least celebrate the Word of God together. Warm it up. Let's use this as a pregame warm up. Talking about the favor of God. These are probably the favorite people, the people that you hang out with the most, the people that maybe just don't annoy you more than other people. Maybe they're simply just fun to be around or people that you maybe tend to compliment, the people that you invite out if you're doing something, the people that you buy gifts for out of everybody else. Don't tell me you buy gifts for everybody. There's certain people you buy gifts for. People you simply show favor toward in life. How many people admit they have a favorite? Husbands, keep your hand up if this is your wife. Yeah, that's called an alley-oop. That's what that's called. You're welcome. Dunk on that. However, the question isn't whether or not we have favorites. The real question is, does God? Does God have favorites? to whom he shows his favor. Does God have favorites? Now, before you go ahead and say, no, pastor, God loves everyone the same, can I make sure you're not mistaking favor for grace? Oh, we're ready to go in now, aren't we? We're ready to forget the flight story. Let's go. I wanna make sure you're not mistaking favor for grace. And this is easy to do because they are closely related. For instance, grace is described as the unmerited favor of God. However, scriptures like Isaiah 66 verse 2 says, these are the ones I look on with favor, those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. So, uh, so, so, so while grace is unmerited favor of God, favor would essentially be the merited favor favor of God. 
Oh, stick with me. I'm going to rattle some ideas today. I'm going to challenge some notions today because I know what you're thinking. Hey, whoa, 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 pastor. We are a, we are not a works church. We are a grace church. And you're exactly right. We are a grace church. We do believe that you cannot be saved by works. You are saved by grace, but we're not talking about salvation. We're talking about favor. Press in, press in. See, while grace is the unmerited favor of God, there has to be a merited favor. I know know I'm gonna have to give you a ton of scripture today. This is gonna be so biblical. You will not be able to argue with me on YouTube. You'll not be able to bring your stinking theology into the situation. It is gonna be emphatic. So go ahead and take notes. Challenge me with your own scripture. I'm gonna give you a lot. But as I said, grace is unmerited. Another way to say that is grace is given. We know this, Ephesians chapter two, verse eight says, for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing, it is a gift. It's given, it's the gift of God and a result of works so that no one can boast. That's why grace is given. It's unmerited, it's undeserved, not a meritocracy. God just saw you and because of him, he gave it to you. He's like, let me put this into your life. So while on one side you have grace that is given, on the other side you have favor which is grown. You grow into it. Like a good relationship. Like a budding relationship. You grow in favor. We see this in Luke chapter 2 verse 52. It says, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. It was Jesus grew in it. Likewise, in Proverbs chapter three, verse three, it says, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. So favor isn't just something that increases, it's also something that is evident. You see, someone with favor is someone who evidently has the hand of God on their life. That's how we could articulate it. Like like someone who, obviously has just that God's moving on their life. Like God's hand is on their life. Anybody know people like that where you see them and it's like, man, God's on them. Like, like God is obviously on their life. Maybe we would often say, say it like this, they're blessed. That's how we often articulate it. It was to say, man, they, they are blessed. And you can't deny it. You can't deny it. You can see it. It's evident that they're blessed. This is because more than visible favor is tangible. In 2 Samuel, you will find that David had stored the Ark of the Covenant in the house of Obed-Edom. He, had tried, he took it back off the Philistines and he tried to take it up to the temple, but he did it a little bit haphazardly and one of the priests reached out to stabilize the Ark as the oxen stumbled. He didn't want the Ark to fall over, so he did it, bam, down dead. Really what that was an example of is that they didn't prioritize the presence of God as much as they should have. It freaked David out so much that he looked around, he saw Obed Edom's house. He said, just put it in there. Didn't ask Obed, just said, put it in Obed's house. But then we see three months later that news of how much Obed was getting blessed. Like his cattle were having twins every time they had, I just made that up, but I'm guessing that's what blessed is. (laughs) Double for your trouble. You know what I mean? Like he was... He was getting like loaded up. I mean, his whole household got better looking. You know, everything just like his skin was like amazing. Like everything (laughs) was blessed. He was a blessed guy in three months. Think about how much blessing you have to have in three months for somebody to go, whoa, he blessed. Like for it to be noticeably and tangibly different. Like this was... And let me, let me remind you, Obed's house was out of the city for a reason. Because real estate's expensive in the city. That's the truth. So, so you go out of the city where you're more exposed. If there was a raiding army, you don't get to defend your house. You just retreat into the city. And because you're out of the city, you're exposed. Real estate's less expensive. And here is Obed out of the city, not... Probably not as well to do, not living in the city, not living in a little you know, part in the wall where he can outlook over the city. No, no, he's living out there, but something happened dramatically in his life because of the presence of God, where even the king began to notice, man, he's blessed. He's blessed. He's blessed. So David then goes, I need that blessing in my life. 
tangibly blessed. However, more than being blessed with stuff, God's favor toward us results in being blessed with purpose. This is critical, like a key to understanding the way favor works in our life. Otherwise, you could easily misappropriate favor as merely material blessings, which would only cause confusion every time there is some opposition that you face since you begin to question, am I still favored by God? It's a foolish way to approach favor. It kind of be like being on a basketball team and, and the coach comes to you and says, hey, you know what I want you to do? I want you to take it easy today. I want you to just park yourself on the bench. And you go, huh. You mean, I don't have to run up and down the court? No, I just want you to sit on the bench. You go and take your seat on the bench and you see all your teammates running up and down, getting sweaty for the whole time. And you're sitting there even laughing at them saying, look at you guys having to run up and down the court. Check me out. How favored am I? I'm sitting on the bench. That would be such a stupid way to appropriate favor. No, no, favor isn't the one sitting on the bench. Favor is the one not getting any bench time. Favor is the one the coach says, I need you in the game. In fact, if there is a shot to be taken, get it into their hands. That, that's favor. (laughs) This is already a different way to view favor. In fact, maybe if it could help us further, we could identify what favor ain't. For example, I already mentioned the favor ain't fair. And while I believe that's true, I dare say it's different from the way you think. You see, favor is receiving the blessing of responsibility. (laughs) Take a look at those that the Bible mentions as having favor of God. In Luke chapter one, we see Mary, the mother of Jesus, as the angel of the Lord came to her and calls her highly favored of the Lord. The next thing we see is she gets not only the responsibility of carrying uh, and bringing the Savior into the world, but the ridicule and the accusations of premarital misconduct. So, So she gets the responsibility, highly favored, Ye highly favored, great. Imagine receiving that. The angel comes to you and says, highly favored. And then was to roll out all the opposition that you're going to receive. It's not just Mary. Consider Jesus. As we read at the beginning, after reading the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, acknowledging that he is the one to announce the year of the Lord's favor, acknowledging the favor of God in the form of responsibility, he's come with a mission to proclaim liberty to the captives, recover sight to the blind. He, he's coming with a purpose, and on the other side of him saying that, the whole congregation tried to push him off a cliff. Favor. You're right. Favor ain't fair, which is why favor ain't for everyone since it comes with a greater responsibility and is so often met with opposition. In fact, maybe I could take you to the Old Testament for a moment because if there was ever a clear picture of favor, it had to be with Joseph. You all know about Joseph, right? Joseph with the colorful coat, the coat of many colors. What we see in Scripture in the Old Testament is Joseph was so stinking favored out of all his brothers that his dad made him a coat, especially for him. He was the youngest of the brothers. He was a favored because he was born to, in his old age. And so ultimately what we see is this favor lavished evidently upon Joseph out of everybody else. It says this in Genesis chapter 37, verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his sons. Because he was the son of his old age and he made him a robe of many colors. Colors. Check out this next verse. But when his brothers saw their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Okay, so Joseph has evidently the favor of his father. However, that, fa- that favor was met with immediate opposition. In fact, throughout his life, we see this as a reoccurring theme with Joseph. I don't know your biblical history. I don't know how long you've been in church. I don't know if this is brand new to you. Sometimes I say Bible characters without going into the story and people have no idea what the Bible stories are. But what you need to know about Joseph is that was the first indicator of his favor not working out so fair. That throughout his life, we see that time and time again, he was favored in situations, favored with God and with man, but yet met opposition all the way through. For instance, he was sold into slavery by his brothers. 
but ended up as a servant in Potiphar's house. It says this in chapter 39, verse 2 of Genesis. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. However, Potiphar wasn't the only one Joseph found favor with. How many people know Potiphar's wife also favored Joseph? Facts from the Bible. Modern housewives of Israel, I guess. It's happened at every stage. Whether it was in the pit, in the palace, in the prison, every place he was in, he would find favor. And then on the other side of favor, he would find opposition. That doesn't seem fair. What good is favor if on the other side of favor, I met with opposition? Y'all still want favor now, right? Yeah. We're quick to want favor, but when we see the pattern of favor that whom God puts his favor upon, they always face. We see this with Abraham. We see this with Noah. We see it with Moses. We see it with David. We even see it with the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, man, I love the way he speaks about favor. Check this out in his letters to the Corinthians. He explains God's favor on his life different. He says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. He says, are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. <laughs> I don't know why I like that so much. I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hand of the Jews the 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked at, an, at a night and a day. I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger, this is like a rap, danger from false brothers in toil and hardship, or maybe a country song through many a sleepless night. In hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from all these other things, there's the daily pressure on, on me, my anxiety for all the churches. Someone say hashtag blessed. <laughs> this is the favored of God. God said, Paul, I have chosen you. I have called you out of your wicked ways into my marvelous light so that you can fulfill the grand purpose I put on your life. I like he says, he says, are they servants of Christ? I'm better. In other words, I'm God's favorite. Doesn't look like it, Paul. After saying I'm God's favorite, he lists all his ailments. After saying I'm God's favorite, he lists all the obstacles and the opposition that he's experienced as God's favorite. That's like you saying, uh, out of all my siblings, I'm my parents' favorite. Yeah, I didn't get to go to private school. Yeah, I didn't get an allowance. Yeah, in fact, I had to fend my, myself. And start to list all the things and go, see, that's why I'm my parents' favorite. I think Paul's got it backward, don't you? I think... Paul may be missing something, or maybe we are missing something. And Paul says, I'm God's favorite, not because he was arrogant, but because he had the clear conviction that he was working harder for God than the rest of them. He says, I'm God's favorite, and he proves it by showing how hard he's worked for God. Now, all the grace folk are going to be like, oh, here we go. He's going to bring in works here. Yes, I am. <laughs> You're exactly right. Because while grace and favor are very similar, they're very different. Grace isn't earned, favor is. <laughs> this is because favor is connected to seeking God and the result of outworking what God has called me to do. Favor is ultimately found. Let me show you in scripture. Proverbs 8, 34 says this. Blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors. For whoever finds me finds life 
and obtains favor from the Lord. Likewise, Proverbs 18, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Why do you obtain, yeah, you can clap for that, that's fine. It's another layup. Why do you obtain favor from God when you find a wife? It's when you need it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm messing. Opposition, I'm kidding. It's Bible, it's Bible. I had the opportunity to uh, sit in a Jordan Peterson lecture this week in San Jose. It was fascinating with a whole bunch of other intellectual folks and we're sitting in the lecture and uh, it was great for a couple of hours. And then at the end, he did Q&A and he asked people in the crowd what questions they would like to ask. And this one guy literally asked, he said, how do you talk to women? That's a, that's a bold question to ask in a crowd. You know what I'm saying? Exposing himself. He's like, how, how do you talk to women? And I love Jordan's answer. He says, you don't. You listen. That nerdy crowd responded way more than you are right now. And you're in church. <laughs> He's like, you don't. You, you listen. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. As I said earlier, differentiating between grace and favor is the key to understanding the way God's favor works in your life. You see, grace is a result of what Jesus did for us. Favor is a result of what we do for him. Why would you need God's favor if you ain't doing nothing for his purpose? What would be the purpose of having the favor of God just to sit idle in your life just as if the favor of God is meant to give you more material blessings. What I found about more material blessings is that keeps you more comfortable. But the purpose of God is not found in comfort. The purpose of God is found in discomfort. That when you get moving for God and you get on purpose for God is when you need God to break through. And it's not the favor of God that brings opposition. Just moving on purpose will bring opposition. But the favor is there to break through the opposition, to turn the opposition around, to help you achieve the purpose of God. People leaving early for the football. Stay a little bit, just stay, just stay. Trust me, it'll be worth it. Better than the football game, trust me. Psalm 90 verse 3 puts it this way. Let the favor of the Lord our God be on us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, a step, like emphatically. Yes, establish the work of our hands. It's up there, right? Should have highlighted it for you so you can see it in the midst of the universe. The fact that let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us. See the context here. And establish the work of our hands upon us, emphatic, yes, establish. If something's repeated in Scripture, it's there so you would take notice. That what we see the psalmist do is emphasize that God's favor is connected to what we do. God's grace is a result of what He does, but His favor is connected to what you do. This is so challenging. Because we all want to just sit in the blessing. Like as a result, I get the blessing. There are so many blessings you have in Christ Jesus just as a result of being connected to him. Don't worry. You are not lacking one thing. Every spiritual blessing is yours in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. We know that. But there is this favor for those who choose to do the will of God. Those that seek Him, those that show up, those that get on mission for God, those that fulfill the purpose that He puts before you, that outwork the calling in your life. So while God's grace is unmerited favor toward me, and that's how I'm saved, by a recipient of grace, when I put grace to work, that's when I begin to walk in His favor. This is why favor is difficult to see if you're simply looking for surface blessings. Especially in the midst of a job loss or a diagnosis, or a season of difficulty. However, that's when you start to put grace to work. And when you do, it puts a new lens on our series verse in Romans 8, 28. Check this out. It says, and we know for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called 
according to his purpose. When we read this, we often miss the conditions. We just want to, we just want to say, for those that God loves. And you're right, God's love is immense. God loves everybody. But don't say for those God loves. It says for those who love God. I don't know how many times you've read this and missed that. There's a condition. It doesn't just say God works everything together for good. No, he says, for those that love God, he works all things together for good. There's a condition. There's a condition. Oh, trying to preach this right. Favor ain't for everyone. Because favor is for those who love God. When you have the favor of God, hardships become the stepping stones in the pathway to his purpose. In fact, that's hard, there's hardly a better example of this than with Peter. At the, after the resurrection, we see Jesus meeting with the disciples and they're eating breakfast, having some fish. And you've got Peter who's still de- dejected because he denied Jesus three times. And Jesus comes to Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? Such a weird statement. Peter, do you love me? Out of all the things he could have said, like, Peter, don't worry, I forgive you. <laughs> like, Peter, I've got grace for you. He doesn't say that. He says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord. You know I love you. Again, he asked him, Peter, do you love me? Three times. Three times. Well, Peter was most probably uncertain about his purpose. Have I wrecked it? So Jesus asked him again, do you love me? And every time he says, yes, Lord, I love you, he says, feed my sheep. He reminds him of his purpose. Favor ain't just so you'll be blessed materially. Favor is that you'll be blessed with purpose. Do you love me? Watch as I put purpose before you. Do you love me? Watch as every painful thing becomes purposeful in your life. Do you love me? Watch as every obstacle becomes a stepping stone in the path of your story to see the way I delivered you and the way I worked in your life and the way I brought you from that miry clay and I set you on a mountaintop. Do you love me? Watch as you love me and you outwork your love, how I set you on a trajectory that's different from everybody else. Yeah, I've got grace for people, but I've got favor for those that will stand up and take hold of what it is I've called them to do. Those that are diligently seeking me, those that are fervently praying, the, right, the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. There is an effort and an action on the other side of being a recipient of grace that I have to take responsibility for. But God's favour ain't for everyone. God's favour are for those that love God. Those that need God. And say, God, I'm, I'm wanting to fulfill your purpose. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. This is why Yahweh instructs Aaron in the Old Testament in Numbers to pray a blessing over the nation of Israel. It's a prayer of blessing. Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 says, May the Lord bless you and protect you. Why would you need the protection connected to the blessing? May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Why do you need peace if your situation is already peaceful? God knew that the purpose for his people was going to come with turmoil, opposition, obstacles that they would have to overcome. So he said, pray this prayer over them, Aaron. Pray pray his favor would go before them and make a way. Pray his protection over them from my blessing. That my blessing isn't just staying in a captive land but being comfortable. It's coming out into freedom but facing the opposition in every single stage. But you're going to go with my favor. Trust me, you will face obstacles. The favor of God is not avoiding obstacles. It's having the power of God to prevail in every obstacle. We all face obstacles, but those favored of the God of God will prevail. Those the favored of the Lord will overcome. Those that are favored of the Lord will be victorious because God has a way of working our worst things into our greatest moments. You still want favor? But the question is, do you want his purpose? Because his favor is connected to his purpose. 
His favor is connected to the very purpose that he has for your life. Favor ain't for everyone. Favor is for those that love God, those that are called of God. He works everything together for his good.